So, <clears throat> the title of my paper is Mystical Auscultation, and I'm going to begin with a brief uh, comment on the senses of the title, which I realize are not fully developed by the paper. Uh, the word uh, auscultation is here chosen not only because it's Latinate and uh, suggestive of intellectual authority, um, but, it's, uh, but, it's, but it's a term for, it means listening, hearing, um, but it's a term for hearing which I think accentuates the sense in which hearing, listening is an act. Aus, uh, refer, it comes from out, is from ear, from the ear, and although the etymology is obscure, it has been suggested that the second part of the word is from clinare, like to in inclinate, so we think of to bend an ear. Um, so it's we've hearing, and of course it has a medical sense. Auscultation is uh, listening to the sounds of the body. So, and of course the sounds of the body or the ear is part of the body. You could say that auscultation approaches the idea conceptually, uh, the idea of listening to the ear or, or of a hearing of hearing, kind of looped hearing. But in the sense of an action, it, the term reminds us that hearing is always must be directed. We must move our hearing. Consciousness directs hearing, listens to hearing. Um, so what then does mystical auscultation mean? M might it mean just terminologically? It can mean a listening to hearing um, beyond itself, beyond hearing. Listening to hearing so as what would take you beyond hearing. It would be sort of an apophatic listening, um, a hearing of what is unheard. Remember the word mystical means uh, essentially what is hidden, what is uh, occluded or what cannot be represented. Maybe a hearing of hearing itself. Or we have in the Middle Ages this scholast primarily scholastic um, uh, definition of God, the divine being as pure act, as actus purus. Uh, it's a kind of Aristotelian notion, right, that, that, that God is the, is the act of himself, that like God is not an agent in the sense that human beings are agents that have, you know, achieve ends, but, but um, um, so one suggestion here would be, well, what would, it think, what would it be to think the actus purus in terms of hearing, a sort of absolute hearing, a, a, a hearing as, a, as, as an act of itself? I have three short epigraphs, first from Cicero. The ears of mortals are filled with this sound, but they are unable to hear it. The second from Hildegard of Bingen. In Adam's voice, before he fell, there was the sound of every harmony and the sweetness of the whole art in music. And last, from Meister Eckhart, there we hear without any sound. As if echoing in the space between the unhearable sound which fills the body and the incorporeal hearing that takes place without sound, Christina Mirabilis, 1150 to 1224, was known to produce astonishing harmonies in the following manner. Sometimes, this is a quote from her Vita, or life, sometimes while she was sitting with them, these nuns of St. Catherine's, um, she would speak of Christ, and suddenly and unexpectedly, she would be ravished in the spirit, and her body would roll and whirl around like a hoop. She whirled around with such extreme violence that the individual limbs of her body could not be distinguished. When she had whirled around for a long time in this manner, it seemed as if she became weakened by the violence of her rolling, and all her limbs grew quiet. Then a wondrous harmony sounded between her throat and her breast, which no mortal man could understand, nor could it be imitated by an artificial instrument. Her song had not only the pliancy and tones of music, but also the words, if thus I might call them, sounded together incomprehensibly. The voice or spiritual breath, however, did not come out of her mouth or nose, but a harmony of the angelic voice resounded only from between the breast and the throat. It is beautiful that Christina does this. That is beautiful more in light of the fact that she does it than due to the nature of what she does, however enchanting it sounds. Or better, this harmonic whirling, whereby the saint's body spins into being a superlative toy of its own divine game, opens a third domain of shimmering depth where what and that become indistinguishable, 
where what she is doing is that she is, and that she is doing it is what she is. To make this sound less loopy and a little more, recall the correlative nature of deixis, the category, as Agamben says, within which language refers to its own taking place, and its grounding of mystical discourse. As de Certeau says, where should I write? That is the question the organization of every mystic text strives to answer. The truth value of the discourse does not depend on the truth uh, value of its propositions, but on the fact of its being in the very place at which the speaker speaks. The ground of musical hearing is likewise deictically turned. As Guarino Mazzola explains in the Topos of Music, the special class of shifter or deictic signs is very important in music. Their significance transcends the lexical reality and penetrates the unsayable existence of the system's user. In music, deixis, such as emotional signification, is the standard situation. And as the twin autodeictic dimensions of music and mysticism coincide in the principle of speaking through muteness or signifying by unsaying, and consider here the human gesture of pointing to something astonishing while covering one's mouth, you know, often in fear, horror, astonishment. Uh, so does Christina's ecstatic spinning in place produce a literally mouthless yet still verbal harmony. I begin then with a simple first, re uh, with a first response, a response that would itself be first. Something important is simply in evidence, in motion with the spontaneous fact of Christina's moving. As if with equal suddenness, I have caught myself looking at her for longer than she was even there an order of reaction to anticipate by echo the timeless telos of mystical union when the soul realizes, as it says in the mirror of simple souls, quote, where she was before she was. From this ground zero impression, it follows in the aura of our not possessing real knowledge of the nature of her action, that something is here actually disclosed, if we can keep to the simplicity of it, about the beautiful essence of doing about the intrinsic worth of action itself. I start then from the position that the saint's resonance spiraling is a standard of action, a paradigm of doing, just as her behavior itself is literally paradigmatic, characterized by the suspension of reference and normal use, and is beside itself, para dekhnimi. Christina astonishes because she acts ecstatically beside herself, and, it is, be and is beside herself, with activity. And it is precisely this that makes her, the person, not paradigmatic, not exemplary of her class, that is the human, but something unaccountably more special, a saint from the word sacer, something set apart. The saint is not a person who shows you what to do, but someone who demonstrates what action should be. And it is this that makes her a most true person, or something that sounds through itself, per sonare. <coughs> Wishing to become a stethoscope or speculative ear placed upon Christina's breast, something that can hear the hidden voice of her heart, this commentary will perform a hermeneutics of auscultation proper to the interface between mystical vision and the body as instrument of impossible sound. Our task is to see in the mirror of this whirling harmony what Christina hears. More specifically, rather than treating the saint's behavior as an occult phenomenon, a religious miracle, or a hagiographic story, I would try to draw from its movement a vision of intelligent action according to the following three definitional criteria. One, action is specular. It is the inherently delightful mirroring forth of the hidden nature and reality of the agent whose being is thus amplified. Dante writes, for in all action, what is principally intended by the agent, whether he acts by natural necessity or voluntarily, is the disclosure or manifestation of his own image. Whence it happens that every agent, insofar as he is such, takes delight. For, because everything that is desires its own being, and in acting the being of an agent is in a certain way amplified, delight necessarily follows. Such is the activity of the whole universe, which is nothing but the self-intensifying and specular instrument whereby reality, or God, uh, quote, who was originally unconscious, as Mayor Baba says, now becomes oblivious of oblivion itself 
and gets the real and final answer to his original first word, who am I, as I am God. Two, action is intelligent when it is true to, this, to the universal task of life, which is to free itself from itself. Absolutely. Mayor Baba writes, all action except that which is intelligently designed to attain God-realization creates a binding for consciousness. It is not only an expression of accumulated ignorance, but a further addition to that accumulated ignorance. All life is an effort to attain freedom from self-created entanglement. It is a desperate struggle to undo what has been done under ignorance. And three, intelligent action is musical in the sense of being a movement perfected in the play of a beneficial release of the formless into form. Again, Mayor Baba writes, to penetrate into the essence of all being and significance and to release the fragrance of that inner attainment for the guidance and benefit of others by expressing in the world of forms, truth, love, purity, and beauty, this is the sole game which has any intrinsic and absolute worth. All other happenings, incidents, and attainments in themselves can have no lasting importance. There's the metaphor of fragrance here, which it's too bad he didn't say music, right? But there we should remember there's a strong connection between, between fragrance and music um, that's communicated perfectly in the medieval sense, sense of the word sweet, right? it's sweet music, sweetness. And it's also something that's carried by the air. It has this kind of, uh, almost a kind of, um, yeah, sort of aerial uh, materiality about it. So, in, so these are my three criteria of, um, of, say, true or authentic action. In some, intelligent action is the musical revelation of truth. For as Charan observes in Tears and Saints, only music gives definite answers. To affect this, my commentary will compose itself by considering three aspects of its principal idea, specularity, intelligence, and musicality, in correlation to the stages of Christina's movement, speaking, spinning, sounding, understanding that all aspects are perforce also present in each stage, and that the whole event, like the anagogic sense of scripture, which gives a foretaste of paradise, is mystically forth, a participation in what stands beyond the triune count of time. The hidden, unrepresented medium of Christina's movement is her own mystical listening. Our listening to which, that is hearing her hearing, will both explain her astonishing behavior and articulate the nature of true action. The appropriateness of this method of understanding Christina's movement is underscored by its legibility in terms of the universal procession of love through gross, subtle, and mental spheres in the respective forms of lust longing and resignation. First, she follows her pleasure beyond its inherent insufficiency into vehement passion and ecstasy. Second, she spins towards union in what flesh cannot possess. And third, she is quieted in surrender to the will that speaks through her. This in turn is the pattern action must follow, that it will follow when one listens to it. Now I must say that my commentary is not finished because 20 minutes didn't allow enough room to finish it. So I'm only going to be actually commenting on the first of my three stages. You'll just have to <laughs> listen in silence to the other ones. But I will eventually write them. So this is the rest of the paper, just a commentary, just on the first, uh, first line. Sometimes while she was sitting with them, she would speak of Christ. And suddenly and unexpectedly, she would be ravished in the spirit. To speak of Christ is to reflect upon the human mirror of God, upon the perfection that speculates you infinitely beyond itself, to recognize, recognize the God-man as one's mirror. It is to voice a universal cognizance of life as ordered towards its imminent beyond, in continuity with action as primary recognition. As Mayor Baba says, man's cognizance is life, in man, and man's life is made cognizant through the actions of man. So Claire of Assisi tells one to gaze within this mirror continually, yugiter, a word whose compound root, the Indo-European compound root, 
literally and nearly oroborically, it could mean like, like life life or age life or eternity life or long life. Um, nearly oroborically signifies long or eternal life and whose semantic association with flowing water conveys the principle of that which is always streaming beyond itself. Clara Vassisi writes, look upon this mirror, this speculum, every day, O queen and spouse of Jesus Christ, and continually, yugiter, study, speculare, your face in it. This looking is more than meditation upon perfection's attributes, for these, indicated by Claire as poverty, humility, and love, are only the parameters of the mirror, she says, and not that mirror itself, ipsum speculum. So try to forget for a moment, to suspend whatever confusing religious uh, devotional associations this, this imperative might <coughs> stir within you. To reflect upon Christ means, generically, to see from or towards the recognition of life that the continuity of action itself is. To address the living work of action, the life one is really doing in the midst of all activity. To recognize Christ is to speculate the speculum, to study the mirror that becomes manifest in the midst of self-reflection vis-a-vis God, that is, the unbounded reality that one has clearly not realized. Reality is negatively specular, an open secret hidden in plain sight like the dark ground or silvering of the mirror, which in Turkish is perfectly named sir, which also means secret. It is the still, true, and unseen speculum wherein life, or basically everything, anything that is anything, appears to itself. What Rusbrook calls the sparkling stone of Christ, a spotless mirror in which all things have their life. The framework of such speculation of the God-man as universal mirror is more graspable and also less if we bracket off the anthropic incarnational model and consider instead the idea of the Christ or avatar as the universal yet individuated life, uh, live appearance of God uh, vis-a-vis all forms the species of all species, the spice of the spice of life. As Mayor Baba says, this divinity pervades the illusion in effect and presents itself in innumerable varieties of forms, gross, subtle, and mental. So Mayor Baba critiques this belief that God becomes man as an anthropocentric construction, and though it's not, it's not false to say that, he, he writes, trying to clarify this idea, though he says it still can't really be explained, but he says it, it would be more appropriate to say that the avatar is God and that God becomes man for all mankind, but simultaneously also a sparrow for all sparrows, an ant for all uh, ants, a particle of dust for all dusts. It's this sort of, that's why I'm saying species of species, right? An heir for all heirs in creation. <laughs> um, accordingly, uh, Mayor Baba often described himself and the function of God-realized individuals in specular terms. He who knows everything displaces nothing, he says. To each one I appear to be what he thinks I am. And elsewhere, the mirror is changeless, immovable, and always steady. I too am like a mirror. The change you observe is in you, not in me. I am always so constant and still that it cannot be imagined. Christ is the appearance of the universal mirror, the face through which reality looks back into you photographing in a kind of impossible flash the invisible fact that you are no more of the world than it. As Jesus said in the Gospels, they are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. The bare phenomenal truth of these words is explained by by Michel Henri. Just like Christ, as a man, I am not of the world, in the radical phenomenological sense that the appearing out of which my phenomenological flesh is made and which constitutes my true essence, is not the appearing of the world. This is not due to the effect of some supposed credo, philosophical or theological. It is rather because the world has no flesh, because in the outside itself of the world, no flesh and no living are possible. Or, as Eckhart says, I once thought, and it was not long ago, that I am a man is something other men share with me, But that I am, that belongs to no man but myself. Not to a man, 
not to an angel, not even to God, except insofar as I am one with him. Elsewhere, Eckhart says things like, God needs me to be God. You know, there would be no God without me. The fact of one's life simply is superessential and divine, beyond assertion and denial. As Mayor Baba says, philosophers, atheists, and others may affirm or refute the existence of God, but as long as they do, do not deny their very existence, they continue to testify to their belief in God. For I tell you with divine authority that God is existence, eternal and infinite. He is everything. For man, there is only one aim in life, and that is to realize his unity with God. One may distract oneself with correlational praise or complaint about the situation, but there is no argument with reality. That which freely exists on the order of a divine word and with which there can be no real relation other than individual eternal union. Reality is itself that which wills it the groundless ground of everything that cannot not will it, from whose hearing grows the mystic desire, as Bataille says, to be everything, too. And as Julie of Norwich uh, hears God tell her, I am the ground of thy beseeching. Uh, this, there's a connection also in Eckhart between hearing and the ground, and you'll hear me play on this in a second. But Eckhart says that the word, this divine word, uh, which is you know, through which one is born into, into one's own divinity, lies hidden in the soul, unnoticed, right? Sort of lurking and latent there. Um, and it's, it's unheard unless room is made for it in the ground of hearing. So this sort of mystical auscultation is sort of a clearing of the ground of hearing. Christina whirls in the place where her ears have touched the ground, in a body that hears the hidden word whose secret grows into the very spiral of one's ears. From Job, we have the lines, Now there was a word spoken to me in private, verbum absconditum, a hidden word, and my ears by stealth, as it were, received the veins of its whisper. A hearing through which one begins to touch, a touching through which one begins to hear, the mirror of the real. Commenting on this whisper, John of the Cross explains the object of such mystical auscultation as, quote, the whistling of love-stirring breezes, el silbo de los aires amorosos. He writes, just as two things are felt in the breeze, the touch and the whistling or sound, so in this communication, two things are experienced, knowledge and a feeling of delight. The delight of hearing is much greater than that of feeling because the sound in the sense of hearing is more spiritual. Likewise, we may conceive of the saint spinning as a kind of spiral organ dance, the corporeal repercussion of spiritually becoming ear, just as the semazen, or whirling dervish, follows from the contemplative practice of sema, which means simply listening. So you're familiar with the Sufi dervishes. They are, they are technically, they're listeners, right? Mystical auscultation is a matter of becoming all ears for the reality that must be there, that is right there, it being that through which anything is perceived at all. So for Bonaventure, the divine being in its radically imminent and inconceivable sim simplicity is the first thing one always sees and so continually overlooks. He writes in The Journey of the Mind into God, uh, how remarkable then is the blindness of the intellect which does not take note of that which it sees first and without which it can know nothing. Accustomed as it is to the darkness of things and to phantasms of sensible objects, when the mind looks at the light of the highest being, it seems to see nothing. And it does not understand that this darkness itself is the highest illumination of our mind. To sense this first image is to listen through overlooking so that mystical auscultation, to add a twist to the classic Vedantic analogy, sounds like listening to how the snake, that is the rope or reality, which one cannot without illumination not perceive as a snake, as the universe and everything else, sounds like a rope. So it's like listening for, you can't see, once you're trapped in the illusion, you can't see that it's a rope, but you can listen for how it's, how it's not a snake. <laughs> Christina's uh, spiritual rapture, the spiraling of this little, little Christ, is a flying falling into the mirror that her speech 
in the secret of its hearing reflects. How does hearing mystically mediate between her speaking and spinning? What initiates her sudden rapture? How does this spontaneous transition touch the nature of true action? The answer to these questions lies in the inherent negative infinity of the will, whose weird, hyper-lonesome nature, answerable only by the infinite, is to mutate and accelerate itself by means of its own privation. This is why mystical tradition gen generally orders affect above intellect, heart overhead, and practice before theory, as that which alone can speculatively show the way or lead the mind beyond itself. What makes it impossible for Christina to remain speaking is simply the hidden negativity or occluded insufficiency of the pleasure of speculation. More literally, uh, to speak of Christ means to see once again that speaking of Christ is not enough. Not to mention the inevitable intuition that to realize that truth, one must at last silence oneself. As Eckhart says of salvation or eternal birth, what does it avail me that this birth is always happening? If it does not happen in me, that it should happen in me is what matters. The grace of Christina's rapture is something that arrives desperately from the darkness of reflection, when reflection, due to the very truth of its own delight, becomes insufficient, an insufficiency that is not predicated upon lack, but an unassimilable surplus, namely the fact that what one is speculating is also looking at you. Again, Eckhart says, the eye with which I see God is the same eye with which God sees me. Such is the beautifully black mirror pupil of bewilderment that sends one into spin, as per the Sufi understanding of hira, or bewilderment, in connection with the word hira, which means whirlpool. It's a kind of pun in Arabic. The perplexity of a swirling reality inseparable from one's own being. Ecstasy is never a matter of escape, but of the feeling of complicity with something that is too real excessively real. So bewilderment to be rigorously distinguished from intellectual confusion is, as Ibn Arabi explains, the dead-end exit which leads all the way to the absolute. He writes, rational speculation leads to bewilderment, and theophany, or revelation of the divine, leads to bewilderment. There is nothing but a bewildered one. There is nothing ex ex exercising properties but bewilderment. There is uh, there is nothing but Allah. What separates mystic from philosopher on this point is that she realizes in the action of her own being what he at best thinks to do, namely, as Mayasu says, project unreason into things themselves and discover in our grasp of facticity the veritable intellectual intuition of the absolute. The positive insufficiency out of which Christina's ecstasy spirals in bewilderment is structurally identical, if I listen to her rightly, to that which is felt in all limited forms of love, of which lust is the most familiar. Mayor Baba writes, the unambiguous stamp of insufficiency which lust invariably bears is in itself a sign that it is an incomplete and inadequate expression of something deeper, which is vast and unlimited. In this manner, the irrepressible voice of the infinity of God's love indirectly asserts the imperative claims of its unexpressed but unimpaired reality. Christina's ecstasy flows alive from an unreasonable but no less scientific courage to venture the voidal ground of her own will and exit the circle of foreseeable pleasure. So the vector of true action is corrective of the self-repetitive will to gratification precisely by virtue of being the real order of pleasure seeking, one that listens to delight's essential specularity and touches the profounder promise of its own failing. Likewise for speculation, which is also a delightful act. True speculation is that which ecstatically exits and enters through the factical whole of its own insufficiency, for to do so is the very tune of loving intelligence. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. Okay, good. Yeah.